Today, it's all about posing with Vanessa Joy on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, your host, and we have a great show lined up for you today, but it is a different one. I'll explain more as we go through. Let's just say we've got a lot to get through, so I want to dive in right away. Let me bring our guest in, the amazing Vanessa Joy. How are you? I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm doing so good. It's wonderful to see you again. Uh, we ran into, you've been on the show before for a show called yes. Elevate Your Wedding Photography, which people go look mm -hmm. it up. Great show. Uh, you're a wedding photographer, speaker, educator, author, and I ran into you in February at WPPI, and we started mm -hmm. talking about doing another show. And as we did, immediately you said something that you were on your way to do a workshop at WPPI that dealt with posing. Yes. <laughs> that stuck in my head, and that kind of brings us to today. So first of all, a quick just recap for those of you that didn't watch the first show or if you're under a rock and you don't know who Vanessa Joy is, when you meet somebody new and they say, oh, Vanessa, what do you do for a living? How do you explain <laughs> yourself? I say I'm a wedding and portrait photographer and dabble in YouTube too. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I would say dabble is the wrong word. You're fantastic <laughs> on your videos and on camera, by the way. I appreciate that. Yeah, I have um, the one series I love, my budget photography gear shootout. That's probably my favorite I keep doing. Uh, other than that, I have to admit, I don't love talking about gear, but everybody loves hearing about it. So I keep doing it. <laughs> it's I, I did two shows on autofocus, one on Nikon and one on Canon, and they blew up. But then everybody that expects those shows now doesn't necessarily expect my normal everyday show. So that makes it a little bit different. Um, all the show notes for today are going to be at the blog post at behindtheshot.tv. So, you know, head on over there, check that. If you're, again, all the links that we talked about with Vanessa the first time that she was on the show will be there as well, including, by the way, your off-camera flashbook, 32 scenarios mm -hmm. for creating beautiful light and stunning photographs, your speed posing course, which is at speedposing.com. You have a free posing guide. Now you people are starting to see why I started by saying this is going to be about posing. And you have 11 creative live classes, but you do a lot of other stuff. For those that, that don't follow you, what have you been doing late, lately, Wise Education? Wise. Well, since we talked, I wrote three more books, actually. Really? Yes. Okay, let's um, go through them. What are they? They are the art of wedding photography, the business of wedding photography, and then the business business and marketing, your event business. Marketing, marketing, building and marketing your event business. I can't even remember because I was them all at the same time. But they're geared towards um, mostly business. The art of photography is the one that's most popular because people like the art more than they like the business, which is fine. But they're compilations of stuff I've been writing over the past 10 years. So it's pretty, pretty fun. I will make sure to have uh, links for all of those and the other ones that I mentioned in the show notes. So again, behindtheshot.tv, head up there, find this episode, you'll get all the links. Let's get into posing. And, and by the way, let me just say this really quick on the books that you just mentioned. There is one thing I love, even when you look through your creative live classes and the, the videos that you do elsewhere, the fact that you are willing to not only touch on the art of the technique and, and technical aspects of photography, but the business side, because most working photographers, I would argue, spend more time behind the desk than they do behind the camera if they're successful at it. Oh, I absolutely. love that you do that. Yeah, I prefer it, actually. It's just not what people typically, they want to learn about posing and lighting, not how to put food on their table or, you know, how to buy that next piece of gear. That's interesting you say you prefer that because, because it's so different or it's just exciting to you? It's exciting to me. <laughs> I like that. Okay. So let's yeah. dive into posing. And again, folks, this is going to be a different episode. As we get into photos, I will explain that a little bit, but I just want to start with some general concepts of posing people. Yeah. Nobody panic. It's going to be fun. <laughs> and by the way, she's holding the microphone. Yes, I am. So if I try and go fast during this show, it's because I feel so bad for her, but she's got a great microphone, by the way, if you're ever looking for a microphone, uh, the Sure MV7. Posing wise, what is generically the most misunderstood aspect of posing people? It's not cookie cutter. And 
it seems like it would be because everyone teaches posing rules and posing methods, but it really comes down to how you want to convey an emotion or what emotion or sentiment you want your subject to have. So it's not really about the rules as much as body language. Okay. So does that mean, does that mean the the rules are applied at the beginning and then deviated from, or you do what you need for that emotion and then check to see, I mean, do the rules come into play for you at all when you pose? They absolutely do. I mean, if I'm going to give some kind of emotion or, or try to evoke some kind of emotion from my couples, I also want to be conscious of the, the, the rules, you know, that make them look good or not look as flattering as they should while I'm doing that. So it's everything all together. Which is an interesting point because you just mentioned when I'm posing my couples, oh, men and yeah, women. Are, I tend to just say that. <laughs> you're a wedding photographer. It makes total sense. But I have seen modeling shots that you've done and fashion shots that you've done. When you're when you're posing couples, it merges two problems to me. Posing, <laughs> posing men and posing women are completely different things. So if you're posing a male model or a female model on their own, okay. If you're posing a couple, that becomes this weird meeting of, of, well, the man should be posed this way because it will make him look stronger and masculine. The female might be better to be posed this way because it will make her look, you know, thinner, more, more, uh, whatever, right. More uh, feminine for new photographers, remembering to struggling to remember tips about, you know, posing while they're on a job. What's the key to remembering differences between posing men and women? You know, when you're posing the two of them together and you're having sort of a brain fart and you don't know what to do with them next, just go back to having a conversation with them. Because if you get into this rut of, you know, where should I put their hand next? Where should I face their head next? Like you'll just get stuck in there. But if you start to just have a conversation with them, maybe walk to a slightly different spot observe them and watch how they naturally put their hands. They naturally turn towards each other or away from each other and work with that. Do you, okay, I'm going to ask this because <laughs> I have to now. Are you ever on a job and go, what can I do with their hands that's different? Oh yeah, all the time, constantly. Okay. <laughs> Even at your level, that's amazing to me. So yeah. is there is there a common posing mistake that you see often? that you think is, you know, relatively easy to fix. Oh yeah. It's the head tilt. The head tilt has everything to do with the body language and people screw it up all the time, uh, especially with men. So I don't know if you want, I can show you real quick what it That'd is. That'd be great. And it, it goes back to very traditional, like Monty Zucker days. And um, you either tilt your head and, paraphrasing towards like the high shoulder where it's kind of like this, um, you know, or like this. And it's, you almost want to think of it as like, I just flipped my hair because, and that's like a very feminine, my neck is exposed type head tilt. And a lot of people will pose men and do that head tilt. Now, if you're trying to get that man to have a more soft feminine feel, great, that's a good head tilt. But if you're trying to make him look dominant and you know, fierce or aggressive or whatever, you know, pick a vocabulary word. Then you want to tilt them to the low shoulder and the low shoulder is the opposite. It's not up high, it's down low. And it's a little bit more of like an intimidating stare and you don't see my neck as much. So I see that mistake a ton. So let me add, let me, let me follow up on that. When you're doing, I am not going to do it. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> when you're doing, you know, to the high shoulder, uh, Mm -hmm. Does that change even for a woman based on where the key light is, whether it be natural light or not? You've got a key light. Do, do you do that always towards the key light or do you do times where it's the key lights over here, but you have them, you know, tilt the other way? So you can and, go and low shoulder, what? high shoulder in either direction. So like my key light is here right now. So I can go high shoulder here, but I can also go low shoulder here. Or I can okay. turn away from the key light and do the do the same thing. Which gives a little more mystery to it. Yeah, now, just, I mean, the light, that's a whole other thing. That adds yeah. to your, your ambiance as well. Which, by the way, I do have a show with uh, my friend Ian Spanier coming up that's going to be like this one that's 
purely on his four favorite light setups. So let me explain what I mean by this show being different. And before we get into any images, this show is available wherever you get your podcasts in video or audio only format. Of course, the video is also available on YouTube and all the show notes are down below the subscribe and like button on YouTube, but not the entire blog post. The entire blog post is over at behindtheshot.tv. There, again, both places I'll have links, but in the blog post, I have a sample gallery of Vanessa's work. I've got all the images that we're talking about, a small paragraph about Vanessa. So head on over there and you can find more information as well. I want to thank my friends over at dvestore.com. Digital video equipment needs, if you've got them, head on over to dvestore.com and they'll get you set up. And that kind of brings us into why today is different. And, and I want to take a second just to explain this because when I first came up with the idea for Behind the Shot, it was... I've got questions about photos and I just want to be able to ask them. So what if I start a podcast, I can find somebody and ask them questions. And the idea was effectively myself and my guest interviewing their photograph, right? Taking one photo and let's interview the photograph. How did it get made? Why were the decisions made? It's basically one photograph, but talking about multiple aspects of that photograph, the planning, the pre-visualization, the exposure, the lighting, the post-production and posing. Today, we're going to completely reverse that. Instead of looking at one photograph and all the aspects that make it up, we're going to look at one aspect, posing, but we're going to take that one aspect and spread it across four specific different scenarios, and we're going to use three images for each. So the reason I'm going through this little diatribe here is those of you that are on the audio podcast, I tr usually try and keep it to one image because it makes it easier for you to follow along. In this case, there's going to be 12 images. However, because of how the show is going to run, that shouldn't be a problem for you because everything that we're discussing is more technique and concept that you'll be able to hear and understand. However, if you want to see the example photos, that's absolutely fine. Head over to BehindTheShot.tv. Four scenarios, I said. Solo, meaning one person. Couples, like a wedding couple. What I call standard groups, which is your, hey, Everybody get together, right? That type of a uh, picture. And then what I call random groups, and the best example I've ever come up with for random groups is, think about a band promo where you don't just want all four band members on the same focal plane. You want one behind a desk and you want one against a wall and you want them on, on the Z axis in different places. And what's gonna happen today is we're gonna go through these photos Vanessa is going to help us understand posing men versus women, one person versus many, and the gotchas that you kind of need to watch out for. And as I mentioned, I'm going to do another show just like this, kind of in a series with Ian Spanier, purely on lighting. We're going to talk about his four favorite lighting examples. So, Vanessa, you ready to dive in? I am. <laughs> okay, this is going to be fun. I'm going to bring up shots because I, I am not a you know, good at posing at all. I started saying I'm not a poser and I thought that has a totally different meaning. Uh, it does. <laughs> I'm going to bring up the shots and I'm going to defer to you to explain to us the pose that you're using, why you're using it, why it works, etc. So first example is this young model. Mm -hmm. So this photo right here, you know, I wanted her to appear sweet. For this one, it was actually a photo competition or photo shootout type thing for Sue Bryce's Portrait Masters. It was like an online one. Um, so I got to pick out her sweater and I knew I wanted like just a very soft, feminine, ladylike look. However, uh, this shows that low shoulder head tilt that we yes. were talking about. So what it does is like, she's all sweet, you know, the off the shoulder, but then she has a little bit of mystery to her because we have her head tilted towards that low shoulder, which is a little bit more in your face. There's eye contact. It's a little bit more domineering. And then the other things that make it a little bit more mysterious are the angles of her elbows and her knee. So when you have a right angle, Think of like you flex muscle or like you hold a box. You're always doing it with the right angle. This is a Roberto Valenzuela told me this. Um, so that is like a very strong posture versus the long arm that she has in front. That's an obtuse angle, which is a very elegant, soft look, which kind of fits with the shoulder coming uh, peeking out there. And then with her knee up like that, that's making an acute angle, which has a little bit of like 
vulnerability to it, daintiness, sweetness. So it's communicating a lot of different things kind of on the bottom half of the photograph. It's very like sweet and dainty and ladylike. And then on the top, she's like, yeah, but I'm fierce too. It's, it's, it's a mixture of softness and confidence, Mm -hmm. which I love. So this is that example. You break the rule, right? I didn't match all of my body language. I changed it up a little bit. So you and I were talking in the room, in the green room before we started recording, and I made a comment to you that I, I see this a lot in your work where I see uh, geometric patterns in your work. And this one, I don't even know if you see this. I am just curious. This is totally an aside from the posing thing. I see tons of triangles here. V-neck on the sweater, a triangle. Her head makes one side, then her arm, and then her arm, triangle. In between her chest, her thigh, and her lower arm, triangle. The way the leg is folded, triangle. The way her lower arm forms from the lower left third to the bottom right corner creates her hip and leg being in a triangle. Are you aware of geometric patterns when you're looking through the camera, or is this just, is this just skill? Uh, well, or coincidence. I am, but we'll get to that when it comes to groups. And I'm definitely looking for triangles specifically with groups and, um, and then geometric patterns, usually on backgrounds. But it's also just me wanting to make things different and interesting and asymmetrical. I don't want symmetrical because then it's very stoic. So, I mean, if I was going for a stoic photo, then I'll, I would keep it symmetrical, not geometric and moving around. Okay. So let me run through uh, two other shots here for solo photos. Beautiful picture of a wa- uh, of a bride engulfed by white space. She only takes up the lower 25% of a white page. And it's her back showing the gorgeous dress, the veil. And part of the reason I wanted to use this picture in this is because of the fact this is the back of the bride. She's got a hip push. Her arm is separated. Explain to me your thought process as you were setting this up. So this is a good example of traditional posing and following all the rules. So I specifically posed her feet first so that she's not leaning on both feet. She's leaning on one side. She's pushing her hips away from the camera here, turning her hips slightly so we get that like S curve and it really accentuates her, especially with that dress that she's wearing. I also really made sure that I created space between her waist and her arms. That's going to make her waist look smaller and thinner. That's going to make a more flattering silhouette because essentially that's what this is really. Um, And then making sure that her shoulders are dropped. So there's a nice long neck and separation uh, between her face and her shoulders. So this is like very traditional classic S-curve woman pose. Let me me, me ask about head position. And if this was something you coached or just something that she did. So Again, we're looking from behind her. So her left shoulder, camera left, is down lower. Her right shoulder is up a little bit, and that's the way her hips are, are, are pushing out and her arm is pushing out. But then her chin is not straight out like you would normally stand. Her chin is pulled down towards the shoulder. Was that a conscious thing or just something she did? Uh, it was conscious. So I definitely directed her a lot in this one. And we, I mean, this wasn't the only shot I took. Like there were some where her chin was up a little more and some where okay. it was, you know, turned back a little bit more. But this was the one that created the most intensity. Um, she just got, has a perfect profile. This is such a great shot. Just wow. Okay. <laughs> Image number three in solos, totally breaking the mold of what we've gone through. Rather yeah. than a, a, a bride standing or a fashion model sitting. This is a model laid out on a couch. And this is always a tough one. First of all, when somebody's standing in my head as somebody who doesn't pose people often, I always think to myself, well, it's easier because yeah, I have to worry about their feet a little bit, but they're going to be standing on them. There's only so much I can do here. When you're in a couch like this laying down, you have to worry about Leg position, foot position, hand position, body position, curve. So as you set up a shot like this, it's A, by the way, backlit. Anything you're thinking about as you pose this? Sitting is so much more difficult to pose than standing because you have to put them in a position that's actually uncomfortable in order to get them to be elongated. Otherwise, they kind of flop back and flump into the to whatever they're sitting in. So she very intentionally is not sitting all the way to the back of the couch. She's more towards the front of it and she's sitting on one hip. So 
those are all very intentional elongating her on there where if I had done the opposite, had her sit on both butt cheeks and further back in the couch, she would be like a little short stump and Erica's short anyway. You can actually see me set up this shot on my uh, YouTube channel. It's on my photography budget gear shootout, budget photography gear shootout with Miguel Quiles. So you can okay. actually see the whole thing. Again, I love, so, so let me ask when you get into posing. So she's got, you know, one leg over the other leg, touching the ground, one leg on the couch and her hands are visible, which is one of the mistakes I see a lot of people, which you either don't see an arm or a hand and it looks like they literally don't have an arm or a hand. <laughs> Here mm -hmm. you seem to have intentionally included those body parts that are necessary to make it look like it's obviously a whole person. How detailed do you get on angle of hand, position of hand, fingers? Very detailed. So Erica is a model, but more importantly, she is also a dancer. So she knows how to move her hands. Whenever I get one of my brides and they're a dancer, I can always tell. But I, I ask them, like, I can tell by your hands, you did like ballet, you did something. Uh, and they, they have because the hands are where you can find the unintentional emotion the most because people usually either just tense up their hands and don't realize it or kind of have that stiff thing. For this picture, you know, I wanted her to have a very lazy wrist because she's supposed to be relaxing and just like hanging out there. So I didn't want to like, Purpose, usually I don't like to show the back of the hand, but if I had made her show me the side of her hand or like flip her wrist, it would change the the mood of this photo. It would be a little bit more dainty, a little bit more intentional versus I'm plopping here waiting for like my hubby to come home. I had somebody say to me one time, just have them, you know, rub their hands like this until they're in a natural position. Is there any trick that you use to get somebody? Because I agree with you. I can tell when I judge image comps or uh, critiquing or anything like that, one of the first things that leaps out at me is somebody's hand that, you know, is a claw and just looks unnatural. Are there any tricks or techniques you use to get somebody to relax those hands? Yeah. Uh, I usually tell them to lead with their middle finger and have them move their uh, hand in like a wax on, wax off. So like coming up and then coming down, like leading with the wrist. I don't know if you get the karate, uh, karate kid reference um, and just like have them trace certain parts, whether it's like their hip or, you know, their face, just have them trace certain parts of their body, you know, their arm just with their, their middle finger. And eventually they'll get, you know, that nice fluid. Motion. Okay. So three questions on posing a solo person before we move into couples. Is there any overall helicopter view thought process that you walk in with? for posing a single subject? I start with the feet and work my way up. So give them okay. a good base foundation and then start moving around the rest. Any lighting consider considerations that you're really hyper aware of with one subject? I am. I mean, I'm a sucker for like, you know, that good Rembrandt lighting. I do tend to try to find that. Um, and then I usually tend to try to push people's bodies way towards it so that I get all the detail on like a dress or, you know, whatever they're wearing, but the light going primarily into their face so that the chest and everything else is more in shadow. So it's not going to distract from their face. Okay. Any composition thoughts that you focus on when you've only got one subject in your frame? I love to be kind of like this. Like I love cropping off head tops of heads. Oh, hold on. I got to go with that. Okay. Do that again. <laughs> Right there. Ooh, I love 3D. Like, a good, a good close-up. Yeah, not with this lens. Um, so composition-wise, like it's all about the eyes to me. I could care less about the top of their head and people make fun of me all the time. Like, why are you chopping off the top of their head? Like, because I really don't give a crap about it. I care about their eyes, especially if I'm doing headshots. You know, I want their eyes to be engaging in the photograph when it's like that small on LinkedIn. So that's, that's a big one for me. Rem reminds me of what Peter Hurley said when I was talking to him on the show and he made the comment, it's not like people don't know the top of your head exists. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, it's not like everybody the, knows the mistake it's there of, somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not like the uh, mistake of hiding a body part and you're like, is it there? Yeah. <laughs> What's your main takeaway for solo subjects? Oh, takeaway. I mean, just play when you have one person, you know, start doing one thing and then have them do the opposite, you know, just, just play and adding movement really with anyone, groups, couples, individuals is your best tool. Just have them start moving. You get stuck. Make them 
do a turn to slowly start turning one way to the other and watch how they move. Okay. Couples. Is there any overall thought process that you have generally before we see examples of posing couples? I do tend to go traditional with like the guy having the the masculine dominant pose, which I know can aggravate people. But when it comes to traditional wedding photography, that just tends to be the traditional photo that you got to get. Uh, and then the rest of it can be different. Um, so I do tend to play off like a more dominant and passive role, but I do switch them too. So sometimes the, the bride will be dominant. Of course, if you have same sex couples, you just pick and go you know back and forth of who you want to be more dominant or who you want to be less dominant in the photo. And it's usually good to have one that's more dominant and one that's less. Otherwise, they're like fighting for attention like a bad boy band photo. A bad boy. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Uh, all right. So let's go through some examples here. This is a uh, couple image number one. Uh, bride and groom sitting in a car, door open, classic car. Like, yeah. wow. Uh, gorgeous house or venue or something behind it. It looks like they're in a driveway of a private residence, but it looks like it's one hell of a residence. So <laughs> explain what you did pose wise here and what your thought process was. So this is a good example of the groom is the more dominant. He's in front, so he's going to appear larger. He's staring at the camera. He's got that low shoulder tilt. He's he's the one that's more intimidating versus her in the back. She has sunglasses on. I mean, her head direction is pointed towards us, but she's not stealing the photo from him. Um, another shot that was like right after this, I had her look away, and I actually do like that one a little bit better, um, but I didn't like his expression, so this ended up being the favorite <laughs> that I posed or that I posted. But, you know, this is a good example and she's behind him. So she's smaller. She's taking the passive role in the photograph. And yet she has her arm up as though she's more the Bonnie than just the passive, you know, subservient. Right. But she I has love. it in that acute angle versus right. his is, is that right angle, which is a little bit more strong. Hold, holding the jacket. He's got a little bit, little bit of a head tilt, but he seems completely relaxed. Whereas she's, in the photo, he's almost uninterested in the photo, which, again, plays into that more dominant role. Anything else posing-wise in this shot uh, that I missed? Yeah, we'll look at how her head tilt is the opposite. And then that works out really nicely because then their head tilts are together. So it tends to work nicely when you consciously turn her, her towards the feminine side or one towards the feminine side and the other one towards... Um, the more dominant side. Okay. Image number two, mm -hmm. uh, it appears to be a bar, restaurant, something to that it effect. Is a and bar. This, this is exactly what you mentioned with one being dominant and one not. And mm -hmm. this to me almost combines the first solo image and the second solo image with the back of the bride. So oh, see? what were you thinking when you posed this couple? Uh, so to be honest, I was thinking about the back of her dress because damn, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> so I knew I wanted to highlight the back of the dress with the necklace that we turned around backwards uh, and knew I wanted it to be super sexy. So for her, you know, she has sort of that mystery going on. You know, she's got her man, but she's looking at you. And she's got that over the shoulder look. And, you know, she's definitely more authoritative. She's got that right angle on her hip, but still like, Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm a little bit sweet and innocent over the shoulder with that other acute angle. Um, she's just great expression here too. And that, by the way, her look at the camera is almost secretive. Like yes. he doesn't know, but I'm interested in you, which I love. Posing includes clothes. What was the yes. idea of what was the idea of turning that necklace around her back? And by the way, for those that are listening on audio. I should probably explain what what Vanessa meant by the back of the dress. Damn, it's a it's a <laughs> there is no back of the dress basically, right. and Super basically it's an open back on the bodice area that kind of curves down loose below the waist a little bit. Very very mm -hmm. beautiful, very attractive. What was your thought on turning the necklace around? Was it to help fill the blank area or? 
you know, I think it was just, she was like, hey, I have this necklace. What should we do with it? Do you think it'll look cool? Turned around. I'm like, yeah, definitely. You know, something that's different and unique. Actually, you can watch the whole behind the scenes video of this one on my YouTube channel too. It's called like Old Hollywood Shoot. It might be on Adorama actually, but just search my name and Old Hollywood Shoot and you'll see the okay. whole thing. So her hand, explain hand positions to me. So first of all, her right hand is on her hip, making again a triangle and getting it away so that her waist is thinner and you can see the the curve in her body. Mm-hmm. Her left hand on his chest is, uh, and, and her fingers evenly spaced, a slight cup, her hand isn't like rigid flat. His hand in his pockets, again, I'm always fascinated by hand positioning because I think it can make or break a shot. Explain the, the the hand positions here. So the one rule, this is technically a rule I broke here. The one hand you didn't mention is the one on her back. And according to like old school traditional photography, you don't want to see that hand peeking around the side of the other person. The, the, it, it's like a, the phantom yeah, Adam's family it, hand. Right. The, the phantom hand. But to me, I think I I like it because one, it's showing that that's where his hand is. It's getting them closer together. It's more connected and it's making her waist look smaller too. I think it also emphasizes the roles here. Mm -hmm. Him pulling her in. Hand in pocket. What's your thought on hand in pocket? I, I, you know, I see hand in pocket. I see thumb out. I could care less about that thumb out, thumb in. Wherever you are comfortable putting your hand in your pocket, because that's the point of the hand in the pocket, is a comfortable, relaxed position. Okay. Third one, and I just, I love this shot. (laughs) There is, this is geometry again. It's frame within a frame, beautiful black and white. The look in their eyes, again, the hand positions here are just freaking awesome, especially which I don't see very often, her hand literally encroaching his the back of his hairline way up semi-high on the head. So what was your thought process here? You know, she is a model, so that helps. They are a real couple, but uh, she is like an Instagram model. So with this one, I mean, I have them turned towards each other. And then usually when I'm posing hands on the face, I tell them to think of any kind of rom-com fo- like photo that they've ever seen on the cover of a movie poster. Um, and it's always like his hands on the face or her hands around his neck. So I have them mimic that and then go in for an almost kiss, which is a very difficult pose to do because you have to one, not laugh <laughs> or do because that's a great picture too. And also not pucker your lips because to me, kissing photos, nobody looks good. You're just got like smush face, right? But almost kissing, that's super cute. Very sexy. So looking at this also, the way he's holding her waist, but she's a little bit tilted back, just ever so slightly tilted back also accentuates the curve of her back. Mm -hmm. He's standing up very, very vertical. When you're talking about lighting, I'm guessing this was natural light? It, yeah, it was. So you're outside, you're doing a natural light portrait, or for that matter, it could be artificial light, either one. As you're deciding where to put people or light people against whatever background, are there lighting considerations specific to couples? There are, because you're trying to light the two of them at the same time, and their heads are usually facing each other, which means they can't both be facing the light source. Um, So you do have to look at that. I tend to, if it's a bride and groom, I tend to prefer the bride, especially if she's the dominant one in the photo, or if I'm having him be the dominant one, then I'm going to light his face more intentionally. Okay. Any compositional thoughts that either accentuate or take away from that pose and that story that you're trying to tell with that pose when posing couples? Honestly, I'm always just looking at either rule of thirds or a very exaggerated rule of thirds because a lot of times they'll use these photos for save the dates and want to write save the date across half the photo. So I tend to try to use a little bit more negative space. And here you've got that vertical line on the wall being a rule of third against them, which, uh, again, just geometry everywhere in your photos. (laughs) And I dig it. A couple... Posing wise, what's your main takeaway? 
you just have to get them to interact naturally. And usually that means letting go of a lot of the rules versus if you were posing someone individually, it's easier to follow the rules. Uh, just getting them to interact with each other in a way that's natural because you want them to remember how they feel about each other when they look at the photo, not how you pose them. Makes sense. So let's talk a little bit now about what I call the everyone get together shot, which is your basic group shot. You're not necessarily, I shouldn't say this, but but I'm going to word it this way and hopefully it'll make sense. You're not necessarily posing individual people, but you're going to be aware of the group as a whole, how they look, and you may have to get in and pose individual people. But it's this, it's the standard family type thing. So before we bring up shot number one, what is your overall thought process on posing just, hey, I've got a group in front of me, I need to photograph them? I start with that traditional one first. And a lot of times I do say, hey, guys, get together like you're getting together at the bar for a picture. Um, so it's very casual. I do still look for triangles, though, and I'll show you what that is. This is the everybody get together. You've got seven people here. You need to make sure that they're obviously all in the frame. That's A. You need to make sure that if they're not going to fit in the frame, they are cropped off in a way that makes absolute sense and looks intentional, B. Mm -hmm. But I'm sitting here wondering, like the girl's second from the left, she's facing yes. the other way. Did you do that or did she do that? I did that. I, I get to mix up the symmetry because if I have them all facing the same way, it just, it looks a little bit more stiff. But if I turn them, it's going to look a little bit more natural. That to me, that's the um, where's Waldo. It's the, you know, something in here is not like the other. It brings such an interest to the shot to me. That one twist is that everybody is leaning in towards the bride, but that second from the left is facing away from the bride, but leaning backwards towards the bride. What did you tell a group like this or what, what did you tell this group or what would you tell a group like this? The hand positions. So all their arms are making, they're all bent. They're all making triangles again. Yes. Um, and it's one of the nightmares for, for wedding pictures is everybody's got a bouquet in their hands. <laughs> what can I do to make those bouquets just not seem like a second afterthought? I am very intentional with telling the girls what to do with the bouquets and how to hold them. For traditional photos, I start out first and I tell them to attach your wrist to your hips so you have more of that obtuse angle. Make sure your elbows are not pancaked against your, your body. So I give them like that more elegant way to hold everything. And then for this one, I probably told them to mix it up. Like some of you raise them up a little bit more, some of them down a little bit more because again, that mix of... Um, heights up and down is just going to make it look a little bit more relaxed. And yet their heads are almost all at the same height. Was that intentional <laughs> to bring a uniformity? That's, no, that's just what people do when you say get together, like you're getting together for a bar photo. It's like all faces together. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. All right. Image number two for groups is, uh, again, there's, there's the where's Waldo. One of these is not like the other. So yes. smart. And I, I have never thought about that. And I have to say, from this conversation, that is something I will never forget. I will do that probably <laughs> in every photo now. So in this one, you show more of the wall. They're all mm -hmm. standing up straight. But again, they're all together. You've got third from the right facing away from the bride. And fourth from the right, the girl right next to the bride is facing the bride, but almost facing away from her, showing the back of the dress which is great because yep. now you show the bridesmaids dresses front and back mm -hmm. bouquets at different heights. So explain this shoot to me posing wise. So this is that perfect example of, I want triangles everywhere. Uh, and I don't tell them that, but I do line them up specifically so that everyone's heads are making a triangle. So the three girls on the right and then knock off the girl oh all the way on the right. Gosh. And the, so all their heads are making triangles no matter where you start. And then ideally, so are the bouquets. They kind of did a little bit of a slant. I'm not going to be that picky about it. But um, I just tell them, make sure that your bouquet is not on the same level as a person next to you. So it just varies it up. Um, and then literally, we did the traditional picture before this. And I'll just go, you, 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 or hopefully I know their names, you know, Heather, Jane, and J Jill. <laughs> yeah. You know, you guys all turn the other way. Or Heather, show me the back of your dress. And I just kind of 
pick which ones I want to turn. Wow. Well, and I will say, I think showing the back of the dress on the tall one, the tallest one, Heather, <laughs> was the smartest choice because then it, it accentuates the length of that open back. Oh, yeah. But the triangles, again. All just, the triangles. <laughs> just wow. Okay, so let me ask you this then. You're posing these people and there's always... There's always an issue with background intruders, you know, in my case, mic stands coming out of people's heads. As you're <laughs> posing and you've got a, an arch behind them, because I know somebody's going to say, if I don't ask this question, what about this? When you're posing people in front of walls that are busy or scenes that are busy, where through whatever trickery, whether it be shallow depth of field or whatever, you cannot hide it. Are you aware of the fact that the bride's head is still within that bush behind her? Yeah. As opposed to the bush, you know, her being on the intersection of the edge of it. How, uh, you know, how aware of you are scooch a little this way? You know, it's an in the moment thing. So if we're rushed for time, the last thing I'm going to do is like nitpick because they're not going to remember about, you know, that inch over. They are going to remember about being annoyed and late to their cocktail hour. So right, right. my situation is very unique. I have to choose my battles based on what's happening. A lot of times I will just like crouch down and that hides a lot in the background. And then a shallow depth of field is usually my go-to. I probably shot this at like F2. Which, yeah, wedding photographer, you guys live at 1.8, it seems like sometimes. So we do. here's mm -hmm. another uh, group shot, third one in the the standard get-together group. And oh my God, the triangles are just leaping out at me again. I cannot unsee this. Even the roof is a freaking triangle. So <laughs> I'm looking at this and you posed the scene to me. So the first thing that's hitting me is... This is just an everybody get together, but there are subtle poses of their bodies and the lamps on the wall. Mm -hmm. So explain, explain putting this one together. Well, this one, I definitely wanted more of a sexy vibe. So what I tend to do, aside from all the things we talked about where they're standing and they had a lot of similar heights, so we weren't making too many head triangles. I'll also demonstrate to them like, hey, I want you to turn, but I want you all to touch each other. So I usually have an assistant next to me and I'll say, okay, one of you can do this. One of you can do this. One of you can do this. And I just give them a bunch of different options. And again, like I do with the bouquets, just don't do the same thing as the person next to you. Do something different. I love that. Now, again, I got to ask on the hand positions, everybody touch each other. The, the, Young lady to the camera left of the bride, making a triangle, holding her arm. The one behind mm -hmm. her doing hand on the back, which creates that same uh, bodice look area. You've got the girl on the far left with the arm straight, but the two and the girl, the girl to the right of the bride, camera right of the bride, with that little shoulder. I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, with that little <laughs> shoulder like lift back which goes for the sexy that you were looking for. And then the two girls on the right touching hands. If, if you say to people, you know, touch the person next to you, just don't do the same thing, vary it up as the person next to you. Will you, depending on time, obviously we're showing wedding shots, but all of this applies to any photography, really. If you have the time, will you get in there and, and say, no, 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 move this hand here. Oh, yeah, definitely. And that's why it helps to learn everybody's names, which is difficult some days and easier other days. But yeah, I will. And then I'll be like, you know, Samantha, go ahead and, you know, move your arm up a little bit more. Or the girl on the left, I probably would have asked her to roll her shoulder open a little bit more. Things like that. Love. Yeah, I'll definitely okay. fine tune if I have the time. And if I have, I sense that demeanor with them because it's also about reading the room. Do they want to be nitpicked? Some people want to be nitpicked because they feel like you're paying more attention. Other people don't want to deal with it. They just want to get the shot and move on. Right. They want to go get a drink. Yeah, uh, exactly. So for groups like this, the get together, any final thoughts, considerations, main takeaways on lighting, composition, or just overall approach? 
Oh, I mean, with groups, I'm usually flat lighting because I have too many faces going in too many different directions. I'm just going to put some easy light on them and move on. I know some people do like, comp, you know, composites and go through and flash each person. No, thank you. They'd, most of my clients don't want to sit there while I flash each person. So I'm going to go for more variety of poses and movement and things that are natural just by putting them in easy light and taking some shots. Okay. So last category, and again, this is what I describe as band portraits, but what I want you to think <laughs> of is subjects on a different focal plane, right? That type of a, a random placement group image. I'm starting with this one for a reason, because they're still kind of in a row, right? They're still close to the same mm -hmm. focal plane, and yet they're nowhere near touching each other. Some are behind the couch with their hand on the couch. Some are sitting down in front of the couch. Some in front of the couch are standing and some are on chairs. You have to worry about legs. You have to worry, like you said earlier, right? Sitting is so much harder than, you know, dealing with somebody that's standing. So explain yes. a shot like this. So this one, I definitely did. I do this very intentionally. So I will set up the girls in this kind of position and then I'll tell the boys to go stand next to the girl they're walking down the aisle with. And then for this shot, I take the girls out. So they're all already spread out intentionally. And then I'll, I'll go through it be like, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Give that a lean right there or lean forward on, you know, your elbows, the guy on the, the right. Um, and then the guy that's seated next to the groom there, you know, I, Definitely told them, make sure your feet aren't symmetrical. Do the opposite. So one foot out, one foot in. The other guy sitting all the way on the left, you know, go ahead, lean back. So you're doing something different. Uh, and I explained that to them. It's just communication like, hey, I want you all to look something different. This is more of like a Vogue type shot versus, you know, something that's traditional. This looks like a, a almost a television cast, which, <laughs> I mean, for lack of a better phrase, movie cast, whatever. It yeah. looks like guys that work together that happen to be on a set. And when you get into posing a group like this, the one guy sitting down on the far right, camera right, has his mm -hmm. hands together. So does the guy actually, I just realized on the couch and the guy sitting on the arm of the couch. The other guy has his hand up like this. So let's take a hypothetical here that that guy sitting on the chair on the far right is that guy that whenever you ask him to pose and you know put his hands together does this. <laughs> right. Is there, when you've got a group like this and they're all such disparate per personalities and body styles and body shapes and what's comfortable for A is may not be comfortable for B. Again, time provided, how detailed will you get with person X to say, you know, don't, don't have karate chop hand you know, give a little natural <laughs> curl. How, how detailed do you get on those? It's usually if things are really sticking out to me. So nothing really stuck out to me. Um, and my first instruction is always, I'm going to put you in a position and then just like melt into it, like relax there. And if it feels funny, feel free to move. I'm going to work over off of what's natural for you versus, you know, what I think you should do. So it's, it's a back and forth. It's not just a me dictating. Cause I also think that's a little bit boring. I would rather it be more collaborative and right. I'll, I'll say like, sit, stand, sit, stand, get comfortable. And then I'll move them. If something looks like really off. Number two for the random placement of groups. And here you completely change the viewpoint to an overhead with girls in all matching one piece, laying around a pool. You made sure to include the whole jacuzzi, the colors, all the uniform of the gray on the, the you know, pavers or whatever it is, the blue water with the suits. What's your thought process here as you're posing this? In fact, how did you even come up with this kind of an idea? There was just such a great view outside the window of the pool. They were in blue. So I was like, oh, this is really cute. The bride was taking forever for her hair and makeup. So I had some time with these girls that were finished getting ready. And they always want a shot of them in their matching onesies. But this was just so much more fun. Except that the hair artists were actually really pissed at me because I had them. I wanted them to lay back. You see, some of them are kind of sitting up, but I didn't want everyone doing that. I wanted some kind of splayed out. So uh, they laid on their, their heads and the hair artists were like, now we have to fix them. When you get into the posing part, 
I can almost, I, I almost feel like this was a completely natural. You just said everybody lay next to each other around the steps and they all randomly just, for some people, I'm going to put my foot up. For some people, mm -hmm. I'm not. How involved did you, were, were you yelling from a balcony? I was yelling from a balcony. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. I think my direction, this was a few years ago, was, all right, just go all around you know, think like sexy lighting out in the sun. So most people will put one knee up and I'm pretty sure they were like, Oh, should we put all the same knee up? And I said, no. So some of them, you know, switched different ones and I did try to get them all to lay down, but that didn't quite work out. <laughs> this shot reminds me of a Go-Go's album cover. That's so fun. Image number three, last image we're going to go through on random placement. And I love this because when I first saw this on your site, I wasn't sure this was staged. I almost <laughs> oh, felt good. like Vanessa was standing in a corner and these girls were just talking. The only thing that I think gave it away that maybe it wasn't, and I wasn't confident because my sister would sit like this, is the girl on the couch with her legs tucked under her. I thought, mm -hmm. I don't know that she'd be doing that. But for a second, I really honestly thought this was just, oh, Vanessa walked in the room and went, oh my God, there's a scene and snapped a shot of it. How involved were you with this one? Oh, 100%. I completely staged that. I knew I wanted to have more of like a wedding dress hanging up story versus just like the typical wedding dress hanging up. And again, they always want the pictures of them in their matching little pajamas, but I didn't want to do the same old boring thing with them sitting on the bed. So I was like, oh, let me let me have like all the girls hanging out the blue on the blue couch and then having the bride over on the other side with the totally blown out dress actually now that I'm looking at it, but it worked because now I can see the light on their faces too. I, I, the position here and again, the three on the right, make a triangle, mm -hmm. uh, not leaving the bride out. The three on the right, make a triangle using the same girl with her legs folded. The two in the back and her make a triangle. And yep. the one standing up is a frame within a frame. There's the, the mirror reflection. Oh my God, man. <laughs> Just so good. So is there anything in this shot? Because this to me, I ended with because I think it's the most difficult. Because making it look like they're not just random on a Z axis, but still know that they're taking a picture. This gives the impression that you're a fly on the wall and there's no picture being taken. Is there right. anything that you as somebody posing them would do differently to help enforce that they're not posed, that this is natural. I would have put cell phones in some of their hands <laughs> or coffee cups. Props. Props. Props are everything. Nobody sits around with nothing in their hands. They always got something. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Pop quiz then. Random photo shoot, not a wedding shoot. And... Uh, it's not your place aside. And, and let's say you can't use a cell phone because that was too easy. What, what are your top three go-to props that somebody might not be carrying them on them, but might be in a room you're shooting? In? Uh, any piece of jewelry. That's an easy one. You could have some people just like putting their earring on or messing with their bracelet um, shoes also. So something, it has to be something that they would be playing with. Um, also like a coffee cup or a mug or a champagne glass, um, something along those lines it has to be a little bit part of the story. It okay. can't be like, uh, I don't know, a football. <laughs> I mean, unless there was a wall of sports memorabilia behind them. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So last thing on groups, random groups, is there any overall thought process when you are positioning in depth? Oh, yes. So I like to shoot at a shallow aperture, which when you're shooting in depth, you're not going to get everybody in focus versus when you're like, you know, everybody get together and you're all in a straight line. I can shoot a group of 10 people at F1.2 and actually get them all in focus technically versus if I'm moving them back and forth and back and forth, which I also do to work out height differences sometimes, you know, I have a choice. I can either stick with a shallow depth of field and focus on like the bride or the groom or whoever is the main part of the photograph and let everybody else blur, which I think is okay. Or I can go up a lot higher on my aperture, go to five, six, seven, one, just depending on my available light, which a lot of times the available light is what makes a choice for me. 
or, you know, and have everybody focus then. So you do have to make a choice. Okay. Any lighting considerations, composition considerations, or takeaways for this type of a shot? That one, again, the even lighting is really helpful. It, that last shot is was difficult because I had the bride essentially facing the, the sun, right? Versus the girls are facing in towards the room. So that one's a little bit difficult because, you know, they're facing shadow on the right side there while the bride is facing daylight. So that I pulled some highlights back for sure. Um, so you do, again, just want something with less of a fall off. So your light source further away from the subject so that they're a little bit more evenly lit. So we're going to switch gears and we're going to finish up with a speed round. Your favorite posing tips in general, somebody that's new to this, there may be even a, a well to do photographer, a successful photographer, but they're venturing into posing for the first time. <laughs> What's going to help them when they walk into their first job where they have to pose somebody? Your top tip. You know what it is? It has nothing to do with what you do. It has to do with getting to know your subject and what they want. The best thing I've ever done for my posing is not studying what to do with them, not studying body language. It was sending out a five question questionnaire that says, what do you want out of this shoot? What side of your relationship do you want to show? Tell me what you do on a fun date night together. What do you love about the other person? And that gave me more information on how to wow. pose them, how to work with them and communicate with them than anything else. Okay. <laughs> They're that's... human. See, there's that business side. There's mm -hmm. the business side. You become friends with them in essence, even yeah. if it's just for yeah, a day. You just got to get get to know them. You know, you don't have to go out to dinner with them all the time or coffee. I know that's a fun thing to do, but you're busy. They're busy. Just, uh, you know, send a questionnaire. I want to say, yeah, be human. If you go to bit.ly forward slash joyful questionnaire, you can download the five questions that I send to my clients. Wow. Okay. That is, that's gold. Uh, biggest <laughs> mistake you made or almost made? In life? Do you, you don't have time for Photography. that. Photography. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think the biggest, yeah, the biggest <laughs> mistake I've ever made. No, let's not go there. I think I was 15 and <laughs> no, but photography wise, the biggest mistake you can make if your goal is to be successful and put food on your table is to worry about the craft before you worry about the business because nobody's hiring you for your craft. They don't know the difference between good and great photography. Um, they know the difference between good and great customer service. So that's what will feed you not how good your picture is. Favorite composition rule if you have one? Oh, I'm, I'm a sucker for like a dramatic rule of thirds. Like, you okay. know, vertical picture and my subject's in the, the lowest. Like that yeah. bride shot, which I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. So when I saw that shot, I should bring this up really quick. Which one was it? I think it was number two on the uh, solo image, yeah. this one. When mm -hmm. I first saw this shot, it reminded me of my favorite ad that I ever saw. And this was years ago Ooh. when magazines existed. And- it, you know, I'm flipping through a magazine and there was an ad for Crown Royal whiskey, Canadian whiskey. And mm -hmm. what they had done was there was a giant eight and a half by 11, whatever size, you know, magazine is uh, one page, pure white and little teeny in the middle. I say little teeny. I mean, it was big enough to know what it was a shattered bottle of Crown Royal and one line under, under it that just said grown men do cry. That's amazing. I love that. And tons of white <laughs> space. And yeah. when I saw that shot, the use of white space to me, when done properly, is such, you know, yes, fill the frame. I'm all with you. But right. when white space is done properly, it is such a powerful, powerful part of a story. Uh, what's your favorite drink? Uh, speaking of whiskey, uh, bourbon, old fashioned. Oh, we're going to get along then. I'm a, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I consider myself a collector of whiskeys. I probably got 40, 45 bottles. Oh, but nice. I'm a fan of a company called High West. I'll give them an ad here. Mm. Uh, I'm a fan of a yeah. company called High West. Their American Prairie whiskey is one of my favorites. A blend of two Canadian ryes and four roses is what I believe it is in it. But they now make pre made cocktails, which I'm not a fan of. But the High West Old Fashioned and the High West Manhattan which are pre-made, mm -hmm. you get about four drinks in a bottle and they're little bottles, are really, really good. We just had one last night. 
Good to know. Favorite band or artist? Uh, you know, Joe Busink is probably my favorite wedding photographer, and I recently got to shoot with him for that budget photography gear shootout that I mentioned. So I'm just going to go with him. No, no, no. I mean band, like music. Band or artist, like an band? album you would buy. Yeah. It, to be honest, I'm not huge into music, but uh, my dad was a one-hit wonder back in the day, so I guess I'll choose him. Who's your dad? <laughs> He is a uh, Mike Scavone from the band Ram Jam, the lead singer. Like really, whoa, Black Betty. Yeah, <laughs> I know the song. Yes, that's amazing. That's, yeah, my dad was the lead singer of that band, and now he plays with the Yardbirds. Which brings us now to <laughs> the photographer pick, which you just did. The last time that you were on, you picked Stephen Kramer and Seth Miranda. Are there yeah. any other photographers? <laughs> And you just mentioned when you can do that one again. Any other photographers that you think people should know about and follow? Uh, Joe Busink. Honestly, he's so phenomenal. I did. I went to shoot this video with him and ended up sitting down having a longer conversation. I had to make a second video. That man is so inspiring. Such a wealth of knowledge. Didn't start photography until he was 44 and became one of the most well-known celebrity photographers out there. Like, Shot J Lo's wedding, Christina Aguilera, Kelsey Grammer, Leanne wow. Rhymes, like everybody. Yeah. And okay. he's so humble and so sweet. So, again, I can't thank you enough for doing this. It was, uh, uh, it, it's what I think people need to elevate their craft to the next level is to get better at things that like what you teach, which is posing. And again, you've got books on a million different subjects from the business side to the technical side. You do workshops everywhere. You do a lot of stuff for Adorama TV. You're a Canon explorer of light and do tons of stuff through the Canon educational programs, which I think are some of the best out there. Absolutely. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. Thanks for having me again. And again, links for Vanessa's everything, all her social media stuff, her website, uh, all of her books, those will all be at the blog post at BehindTheShot.tv. If you want to connect with Vanessa, let's just say those really quick so that if you're listening on the audio podcast, you know where to go. Uh, what's your website? VanessaJoy.com. Okay. And my Instagram is where you'll find me most on social media. That's just Vanessa Joy. Nice okay. and simple. Uh, also on Facebook, link in the show notes, Twitter, link in the show notes, YouTube. I'm going to say that one because people should subscribe to your YouTube channel. It's at Vanessa Joy on YouTube. And then I do want to mm -hmm. throw this one in there. The website you have for photographers, which is breatheyourpassion.com. Yes, Explain that. It is. And everybody spells breathe wrong, so I don't talk about it. <laughs> it's If you go to vanessajoy.com, there's a little tab up there in the menu. It's for photographers, or I think it says EDU or something along those lines. Just click there, and I'll send you to a bunch of both free and paid education. Okay. And again, links to everything in the show notes. So just head on up to BehindTheShot.tv. You know the routine, right? Find all the links. Find the show notes there. Again, if you're on YouTube uh, and you head down below the subscribe and the like button, I've got all the links there. But the full bit that I wrote about Vanessa, the sample gallery of her work, those are only at the blog at BehindTheShot.tv. And by the way, the links will include her free posing guide uh, along with the book. So Vanessa Joy, thank you so much for doing this. Always a pleasure to, to do shows with you. And I hope that I run into you again soon. For everybody else, if you want to follow me, it's SteveBrazel.com. If you want to hit me up on social media, it's either at Steve Brazel or at BehindTheShotTV on either Twitter or Instagram. I've pretty much abandoned Facebook, but hit me up on those. I spent a lot of time on Twitter. But the photography obviously generally goes to uh, Instagram. So follow me anywhere. Hit me up with any questions that you have. And thank you so much for joining us. Please do uh, reach out to me anytime you want to. Thanks again for uh, checking out this show. Make sure you join us next time as we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind the shot.